Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? Good. Good. Wow. I was expecting a... Yeah. Wow, we're actually quite awake right now. I am so, so excited to be here uh, to speak with these two esteemed guests as well as pioneers in the transgender community. Uh, so let's go ahead and kick it off. Before we do that, a show of hands here among you guys. This was my attempt to actually wake you all up, but you all are already awake, actually. Raise your hand if you have a friend, a colleague, a family member, or if you yourself identify as an L G. B or T. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Now, if you know, keep them up, keep them up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you are, or someone you know within that category uh, knows someone who is uh, in the transgender community, keep your hand up. If you don't, have those hands come down. More impressive than I thought it would be, actually. Thank you very much. So knowing our audience here, a lot of people still did put their hands down. Um, what is the one thing for all those folks here who are seeing this as an entree into the transgender world, uh, what is the one thing that you want them to know first and foremost? Mara. Um, the golden rule. Treat everybody like you'd like to be treated. Um, trans people are so different and so diverse. The one thing we all have in common is that we were born um, and that we're people. And so treat us, treat us like we're people and everything will be great. Danica. That no matter what you look like, where you come from, how you worship, if you do, or who you love, that you should be welcomed, celebrated, and respected and protected because of who you are, not despite it. Which means that as trans people, we are members of your community as well. We are executive directors of organizations. We are elected officials. We are... <laughs> we are unemployed. We deal with poverty. Some of us are ex very rich and some of us are very, very poor. Trans people walk, come from all walks of lives. And at the same time, that also means that while we have unique issues to us, to our community, especially in regards to health care and certain other equity issues. At the same time, trans people get stuck in traffic too. <laughs> That's why my top issue is fixing Route 28. You know, trans people need clean drinking water as well, and they don't want their water pipes to burst. This is why I want to replace cast iron water pipes that are 80, 90 years old with ductile iron pipes that are more flexible and more durable. This is why, you know, when I talk about the idea that I have 3,700 constituents who are earning less than $17,000 a year and can't afford health insurance, and so they are uninsured, that means that some of them are inherently going to be trans. Mm. Statistically speaking, some of them will be. And as someone who spent two and a half years uninsured before February 1st, which was even after my swearing in this year, I was still uninsured. I think it's really important that when I say that I'm sticking up for you know health care and health insurance for all my constituents, that I mean all my constituents, that LGBTQ healthcare is healthcare, and I won't question your healthcare based on your doctor's orders. Don't question trans people's based on their doctor's orders as well. <laughs> um, I, I'm glad you brought some of those stats up because while we want to be inspirational here, we also want to be educational in terms of where the community has come from. I've prepped a couple charts here, and if we can put those up on the screen, and I'll walk you through a couple of these. Um, this does come from the 2015 US Trans Survey, which was actually done by the uh, National Center for Transgender Equality, yours, Mara. Mm -hmm. uh, this first one up here, you can see the percentage of people who live in poverty in the United States. Uh, up at the top, the general population is 14%. We can see that the transgender community is 29% here. Uh, ha has this changed or from what you've seen? We do the survey every five years, okay, so, so it'll be next year when we do it again. All right, so we'll look ahead to that. So that's just one. I've got two more, uh, so I don't uh, bombard you guys. Uh, the second one uh, is uh, US unemployment and the rate, this is in 2015, the general unemployment rate at that time, 5%, we know now it's about 3.9, right? Uh, the transgender unemployment was 15%. More than one out of 10 people were uh, unemployed at that time. And the last one, which is a very sobering one, Americans who have attempted suicide. Yeah, that's what I thought so too. General population, 4.6%. 
the transgender population, I'm getting chills just reading this, even though I already know this number, 40%, nearly one out of every two people in the transgender community, according to this survey, have said that they tried to kill themselves. So with these sobering numbers, Mara, I'll come, at, come back to you here. Um, try to make these numbers into something that folks here can remember when they walk out that door. Is there a story that resonates with you? Well, I, I mean, I'll tell you about the suicide number. When we first saw this in the survey we did in 2009, we were a little shocked. I mean, it, we knew it would be high. Um, that survey, it was 41%, so we're in the, the error there. Um, but what happened immediately after that survey came out is every time I was with trans people, I would say, how does that sound? And it was like, yeah, it seems about right. And, and it's, it's really shocking. And we know suicidality is up now. Um, with just the meanness that's happening in society now with um, leaders who are speaking ill of trans people. Uh, but to follow up on something that Danica just said that I think is really important, another slide, I, and I'm sorry I didn't think to ask you to put this one up, but we saw that 23% of our sample, we, the survey was of 28,000 transgender people, we saw that 23% of them said they didn't go to the doctor sometime last year when they needed to because they were afraid of being disrespected. Mm. That is outrageous, it's a public health crisis, it's horrible, it's a, it's, it's a million tragedies. But we also saw that 33%, so 10% more, didn't go to the doctor when they needed to because they couldn't afford to. That means the most important issue, trans issue that a trans person is facing might be poverty. The most important trans issue a trans person is facing might be racism, or it might be accessibility uh, for, their, um, for their lives as somebody with a disability. And, and we have to think of trans people in the workplace um, and in our lives as full people who are facing the other things, as Danica said. And what I would add to this is that 40% statistic or 41% statistic is not the product of society that overloves us, that overcares about us, <laughs> that has made everything accessible, as accessible for trans people as every other sort of person. Not to say that every other sort of person has had an easy ride either. And what's interesting is when you look at the Williams Institute um, and the surveys that they've done with this, they found that Trans people who grew up in you know supportive communities, or who just live in supportive communities, who have you know have great educations, who have the same access and ability to you know employment, to just basic dignity as everyone else, mm. that suicide attempt rate hits the national average at 4.5 percent. Mm. So if you want to bring down that bottom number there, then treat trans people with the dignity and respect that you would treat any other human being. And please, yes. And going into the political realm for you, Danica, uh, I do want to pull up this next photo. You know this well, Danica. Uh, this was a photo that went viral right after you won, uh, beating Bob Marshall, who uh, has a specific uh, parenthetical middle name, which I won't say right now. Um, and uh, after 25 years he was in office, it, you prove that transgender folks can win. One, walk us through how you felt here and then two, how do other folks win? So um, what's really funny is if you look toward my feet and you see like that little white, almost looks like bandage, that's actually a plastic bag that I had uh, snuck over my foot to put into my shoes because it was raining so hard and I'm poor, so like, these are my only pair of shoes. <laughs> and I was out shaking hands and greeting voters until right at the very end getting absolutely soaked. So by that point, I hadn't even changed my shoes or anything like that. <laughs> and then um, 19 out of 20 precincts have been reporting. Um, I have a whole bunch of phone calls coming in um, congratulating me. I was like, don't, don't until the absentee ballots in Prince William County come in. But then I got a phone call from Vice President Joe Biden congratulating me. And that's usually the time that you declare victory. <laughs> um, you know, it goes for any other office, you know, when Uncle Joe calls you. But um, 
<laughs> what that moment is, there's my dear friend Mar Marilyn Cart from Indivisible Nova West um, with a uh, celebratory uh, hug and congrats. And there are no tears there. It was all of the sounds and emotion of tears, but after being absolutely sleep deprived for three days and completely dehydrated, there was nothing left in the system. <laughs> and quite frankly, I just didn't feel like standing anymore. So I did that. And what that moment meant, uh, it depends on who you are and your level of interpretation. Sure. Um, if you are a trans girl in Roanoke who's 11 years old, her name is Clara, then you know that after you tried to jump out of a second story window because you thought that no one else was like you, no one else could understand you, after you had been absolutely bullied and tormented in school, and then you worked so hard driving up four hours with your mom to knock on doors, pose for photos, and work the polls on election day, that that victory was yours too, and that that meant that you can be whoever it is that you want to be. And when I met her later up that night over in Lake Ridge, I picked her up in the air, I looked her in the eye, and I said, you can be president. You can be whoever you want to be. And if you are a resident of the 13th district, that is a photo that means 10 months of my campaign and myself knocking on 75,000 doors across the district, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers spreading our message about the needs to fix Route 28, raise teacher pay so it's not the lowest in Northern Virginia, expand Medicaid to cover 3,700 uninsured people in my district, and you know find a cost-effective way to extend the Virginia Railway Express out to Gainesville from the Manassas you know, Airport uh, Broad Run Station. All of those sort of hyper-local quality of life issues that we talked about so much we did with the yes and style of politics, something that you would hear in improv, yes and, always build off. Mm -hmm. I never say, I'm transgender, but I care about Route 28. No, I'm transgender, and I've got a lot of really good ideas for public policy that affect transportation as much as they affect health care, and yeah, civil rights too. You know, when we spoke on the phone last week in prep for this, uh, I asked you, how do people beyond the so-called purple states, Virginia being one of them, of course, how do people in the Midwest of the country, who are transgender, how can they win? Well, you know, um, I was really, you know, I was really sad to hear that, you know, uh, New Hope Mayor uh, Jess Herbs, uh, she lost her election bid um, very recently, um, where she's one of the few out trans mayors in the country. She might be the only one, actually, I think, at this moment. Um, but at the same time, you, you realize that what Mara had told me privately earlier today is that, look, we're going to lose some races. That is going to happen. But we can't win them if we don't enter in the first place. We have to be just as vulnerable and just as susceptible to public policy criticism as well as the misogyny that we'll get as trans women or as well as the questions that trans men will get or as well as the extra judgment that will come upon you because of who you are. And we have to just always remember those words from you know, St. Francis de Sales, be who you are and be that well. If there's anything I took out of 13 years of Catholic school, I'll give you two. One, <laughs> conversion therapy doesn't work. Um, <laughs> and number two, it is that line. It is that, that you know, really embrace of not just social justice, but for sticking up for the underdog and making sure that you know, we don't just deal with equality, which is important, but mm -hmm. we deal with equity too to make sure that the people who need an elevated voice because they've been lacking it for so long actually have that same platform as anyone else because it shouldn't have taken 399 years for the Virginia House of Delegates to not have a super majority of, of white men. Hmm. It took until January 10th of this year, 399 years before we had the first out trans woman, the first lesbian, the first two Latinas, the first two South, uh, Southeast Asian uh, women elected. Yes, it's good that we have those first, but that means that there's a lot of systemic barriers to access in the first place that are prohibiting people from having that same level of success mm -hmm. that so many other folks take for granted. It's not that we're trying to take everything, it's that we want a seat at the table too. Right, and so you have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and Mara, of course, you have been doing that. In 2003, that's when you founded the uh, National Center for Transgender Equality. Um, since I shared a photo of you, Danik, I'm gonna share a photo also of Mara. And this is mm -hmm. you being arrested. Walk us through this. Was this the first time? <laughs> This was the first time I was arrested for anything useful. And this is a... <laughs> <laughs> we, 
we'll get into the other parts after that. Yeah. All right, so what was happening here so and your activism? This was, um, very importantly, I want to say this was at an NAACP um, run rally for trans people against North Carolina's HB2. The North Carolina NAACP, which is a phenomenal organization. And the so-called bathroom bill. And the bathroom bill. And they held this rally with 10,000 people, and 55 of us were arrested for being in the Speaker of the House's uh, uh, entryway, which is supposed to hold 12 people. Hmm. So technically, yeah, so we were arrested there that day. Um, and I'll tell you, we've been we've seen about 200 anti-trans bathroom bills and related bills in state legislatures in the last three or four years, and we've been every single one of them except for this one, and this one has never been enforced. Um, it it made the governor lose. Um, governor McCrory was the only governor who lost in uh, 2016, and everybody knows it was because of this. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, one of the things we do with public policy is when we get attacked, whether it's by Governor McCrory or Donald Trump, we fight back and we make sure we turn a tragedy into a tragedy with a big educational moment. And every single time we get stronger and they get weaker. All right. So with time uh, um, um, getting thin here, let's get to the business of equality here. When you speak to our audience members, what do you want them to know in terms of fair, equal treatments at the corporate level? Maybe you can share a story uh, of success that could inspire folks here? Mark? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been very fortunate. Um, when I came out to my family, uh, I didn't even lose the ones I wanted to lose. Um, <laughs> And I was a consultant at the time, and I lost a couple of smaller clients, but everybody else stuck with me. And there were ferocious um, people who backed me up and, and, and always had my back. And I think that's one of the most important things. I saw something, I'm not going to mention the company, because I, I don't know how they are currently, and this was a few years ago, but there was a trans person who worked for this big company, and she was having a really rough time. And the president of the company had an all-company meeting. This is a very large company that you've heard of. And um, he did the business he had to do uh, on the other matter. And then he said, before I go, I just want to say thank you to everybody for treating Lori so well. Um, we're so proud that we have out transgender staff who feel safe here. And I just want to thank you all for being so supportive of her, because you know it matters all the way up to the top that we treat everybody with respect. And it was a phenomenal uh, Jedi mind trick. Um, but it, it really showed an important thing, which is right from the top, you got to let people know that you care about welcoming everybody. You care about respecting everybody. And everybody who's on the team is on the team for a reason. And, and they shouldn't be discarded. Hmm. All right. Now, in terms of political equality, Danica, looking across the map, uh, in my research, the ACLU has 18 states that has uh, anti-discrimination laws against trans the transgender community, including DC. Uh, how do you feel about that? And what needs to be pushed? I don't know if including, you mean further. Virginia instead of DC. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, including DC, so 18 oh, states and okay. Oh, okay. I guess we're saying. Yeah. Um, uh, how do you feel about that? And where's the next horizon for pushing ahead? Well, look, this is very, very basic here. When we can't change your minds, we change your seats. It's that simple. <laughs> and yeah. and here's, here's the thing for the business community to, to really realize at this moment here. It is one thing for the business community to tell us and to, you know, that we support you as LGBTQ people to sponsor events that are LGBTQ friendly, to put on forums, to put on whatever other things that it is to encourage other businesses, to encourage other people to be involved, be respectful. Those are good things. There is nothing problematic in and of himself with those good things. That said, if you then take your corporate campaign contribution money and you continue to give it to legislators, who single out and stigmatize their, their uh, constituents, and you give it to the party organizations who support them after saying discriminatory, bigoted things in the first place, then you're doing it wrong. Your money counts in that regard. As a state legislator, I don't take any campaign contributions from for-profit corporations, their PACs, or their lobbyists. That's a statement of personal values. But many, 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 many legislators do. And here's the thing. If you take your money and you donate it to someone, or in this case, let's just use a good example, the Republican Party of Virginia's fundraising team put out a hit on me 
after the General Assembly session ended, not because of my transportation bills, not because of my government accountability bills, not because of any legislation I authored, but for signing on as a chief co-patron of a bill to ensure that the health insurance companies would have to cover transition-related health care, which they consider to be unnecessary liberal lifestyle choices. We just beat back that argument by eight points last year. And if they want to keep trying that again, well, fine. Then we'll have to double it at the ballot box next year, I guess. But in the meantime, that should put every single corporate donor on notice that that group has not changed how they've acted. And it is so sad for that. We have got to get to a point where when we see discriminatory behavior happening within our state legislatures, that the people who are donating money to them have to make a value statement saying, this stops now. In Virginia, where it is, in, it is literally against the law for a locality to establish itself as a sanctuary city because the Dillon Rule is a thing, the Dillon Rule ex exists, which means that a locality cannot do anything that the state government has not authorized it to do, and then that bill comes up anyway, and we have to fight against it anyway, that means it's being done to single out and stigmatize people within the community and to create an us versus them wedge of fear as opposed to embracing each other, respecting each other. And so in any form, not just when it happens against the LGBTQ people, not just when it happens to Muslims like the Muslim ban, travel ban, not just when it happens to immigrants, you name it, any time that legislators single out and stigmatize their constituents and attack their constituents, it is our obligation as people to stand up to them and say, not only is that not okay, but I'm not gonna support your campaigns and I will support the campaigns of people who actually do believe in anti-discrimination policies that are, are inclusive and are working to make their communities better for the people who live there. All right, thank you. <laughs> Last question for you guys. Um, I don't want people here to walk out that door and say, that was interesting. That was interesting. What is a top action, a concrete action, that when all of these folks, when all of you walk out these doors right here, what do you want them to remember? What do you want them to do so they, they just don't say, hmm, okay. Find political candidates who do share your values and then knock on doors for them. Make phone calls for them. Donate money for them, to them or for them. Uh, send writ handwritten postcards for them. Get involved with candidates who do share your values. Help them win elections because that's where we make public policy change, all the way from soil and water conservation, all the way up to the federal government and every spot in between. You've got to get involved because this is your America too. And if you don't find someone in your locality or in your district who shares your values, then go run for office too if you feel so compelled. And the reason for that, because you're an American too, this is your America, and you should run it just like anyone else has that obligation to do it. We are a representative democracy within a republic, which means it is up to the public. It is up to the citizenry of the public to run the show here. And for anyone who is here, if you call this place home, if you're not a citizen, you can still get involved with a campaign and still help out a campaign. And if you are a citizen, then consider running for office if you don't find other people who share your values because we need a lot more people who sh do share uh, um, uh, just that message and that view that inclusion is a victory lap and discrimination is defeat. And I'd, I'd say quickly, um, get to know some trans people. Um, I know a lot of trans people who will say to me, transgender people are just ordinary people like everybody else. And I, I know what they mean. They mean I have to walk my dog every night, I have to pay my rent uh, and all that. But I've met thousands, if not tens of thousands of trans and gender non-conforming people in, in my life, in my career. And I will tell you, these are not ordinary people. Ordinary people don't really look at who they are and then go about being that, knowing that they could lose their health their, their family, their job. That is an extraordinary person. That is the kind of person everybody should want on any kind of team. The kind of strength and dignity that it takes to survive as a trans person is something you want on every team in your workplace and every team in your life. All right, great stuff. Thank you so much. Pioneers, leaders, wow, everything. Inspirers, uh, Danica Rome as well as Mark Easing, we could have
gone on, but thank you so much. For many of you, this is the first entree into this. Please do not let this be the last. Thank you very much. Thank you.